Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash finish the fight and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash finish the fight. This is Spartan 117. Anyone hear me? Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. Welcome back, everyone, to Finish the Fight, a Halo podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And I think this is the first time that we've had really a good chunk of updates to give you guys before we go into the main content of the episode for the day. Yeah, um, so if you guys haven't listened, seen, whatever you want to call it, listen specifically, uh, to our little bonus episode we did about the E3 press conference and about uh, Halo Infinite, we gave you guys a bit of news on that, but we're going to, as we do in each episode, expand on that and give you guys kind of the dirty on what's going on on Halo News. Yeah, so immediately after we had posted that episode, a lot more people were taking time and breaking down what they saw in the trailer. So, you know, we, I think everyone knows at this point it's three years after Guardians. Um, we had a developer from 343 confirmed this is the opening scene. I'm sure there's going to be like a little more things added, maybe like a little that quick uh, joystick tutorial and whatnot. But overall, like it's exciting to see that this is not just another engine trailer or anything like that. This is truly a part of the game. We also saw that when the armor boots up that it was modified by Halsey. That's why it looks the way it does now. We have like a tangible reason as to why Chief looks the way he does. Yeah, and what I really love with the trailer and as we talked with the 343 dev in the kind of post interview they had with E3 was they talked about the new slip space engine, which is a great name for it. Um, that the game is going to run on. Mm -hmm. And so they created it for this. So that's why we speculated when Jesse saw, he's like, oh, this is definitely the control stick portion of this, because mm -hmm. like you see it going in, that that will potentially be what you're seeing in-game. It'll, it'll hopefully be around that level of emotion and detail. Yeah. Um, and we'll link in the YouTube uh, to 343's site that you can watch the kind of the, the, the trailer for yeah. Slip Space, um, which is really neat. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what all they're going to really push with that. Yeah, and it looks great, you know, that that it was all made from that engine. It, the, the best looking thing that we're getting from Halo so far, I think, as regarding an in-engine kind of look. Something else I really liked about uh, the trailer itself, the little details that we had missed initially, is that that AR that Chief has is a Reach style. Like, it mm -hmm. almost looks from it. And even in the background, whenever Chief is getting kind of like buzzed back to being awakened, you see a classic marine helmet, which I didn't notice. I think that it's it's truly cool to see that we are getting, I we predicted that mix of art styles. We're not going to completely ditch 343's art style, but have it mix really well with Bungie's. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for that. And like we've said from the beginning of it, we really, really love all of Halo with it, but Bungie's work specifically, and I think a lot of people have said that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 4 was good. 5, through my replaying, like I said, was good, but you can see where it's like, what were they doing? What was mm -hmm. kind of going on with it? So I'm I'm excited to see them potentially rein it back. We'll see. We'll see what's going to happen yeah. with it. Uh, and also something I liked is that we talked about that classic music and we have a new composer, the, the franchise itself, and it's a Curtis Schweitzer. He's definitely really utilizing and giving us a nuanced version of these classic tracks mm -hmm. and something that they did talk about even in that interview with that developer was... Yeah, we really want to like through the art style and the music bring you back, and I think I think they did it, you know, perfectly. So on to other news, and this one's a little older, but we never addressed it. Is that the new Halo TV show? They're not really going to follow the canon, and it's not some kind of multiverse thing. They're just kind of going to go off the rails and see where it goes. And I want to know what you think about that, because the Halo franchise and its fans are very, very married to the lore. So anytime something little does get changed, it, it starts this kind of big upset. So I'm curious as to what you think about that. I honestly would be fine with it. 
I think what you have to do with this is you have to throw in a, a you know a bunch of fanfare with it. Obviously, mm-hmm. it's got to look good. It's got to have the feel and sound and like gritty crunchiness that you yeah. know Halo can bring to it. But at the same time, you have to do a wider audience, similar to what Walking Dead has done. Because mm-hmm. I was a hardcore fan. I know you were a hardcore fan with the comics and, yeah. and knowing all of that. That that you, you have to you have to take some creative liberty when it comes to a more general audience and specifically what network you're on, who's mm-hmm. picking you up, what's yeah. the potential of a second season type thing. So I, I'm open to it. Yeah, as long as they don't, I, I feel like as long as they don't truly just like, A, if they're going to break the canon, make it kind of like for the better, mm-hmm. and B, don't do something that makes no sense and just ruins a character or an event or anything like that, because it, then there's almost no point. Then you're not doing a service to the fans. I completely agree with that. And and what I don't want to see overall, whether you stay, whether they say true to true canon mm-hmm. or that they just blew it out of the water, is don't give me a generic sci-fi war movie. Yeah, basically, because it's it's definitely that drama, and what I've always said, and I'll stick to, is one reason I love Halo is the emotion that it makes Mm -hmm. you feel. So give us that. Give us some badass action sequences with Chief, but please don't, yeah, just make it just shoot, 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 and then we're done with some kind of conversation. Yeah. And so the final thing I wanted to bring up, this isn't so much Halo news, um, but Martin O'Donnell recently on his YouTube channel posted this kind of like 15 minute uh, someone someone sent it to us and said it was like a documentary but he i remember he posted on twitter a week or two ago he's like and he said like yeah i heard an old track from odst and i was like wow that's really good so he he posted this video and it's not, and it's just him playing the skeleton tracks um on piano from the odst soundtrack and he just talks about a few things like he said that it's not jazz, but it's how jazz makes him feel. And he and of course, he wanted to make a soundtrack that made you feel alone and how it just it was really cool. Uh, he also talks about a few pieces and composers that inspired him, along with some very basic music theory that he he told you. And it was cool hearing like those notes then you're like oh my god this is like the skeleton track of this and that like it was cool of course that's kind of one of the one of the best soundtracks in the franchise i think everyone agrees on it so it was really cool yeah i mean i mean besides like just like that kind of blood pumping halo music when you're getting ready to like enter a fight or you know, mm-hmm. like stuff like that this game broke the mold and not only the game itself it's still a first person shooter but you're mm-hmm. obviously playing an odst and so they couldn't just make it this like hurrah hurrah mm-hmm. like we're gonna go kill some covenant. It is like, what happened to my team type thing. Yeah, it was really cool. I recommend it. He has, and I didn't really say a YouTube channel, so he's got a lot of cool ones. He said he's gonna be doing one on Reach here soon, which will also be amazing. So moving on, let's get to the meat and potatoes of today's episode, which is the final book in the first trilogy of books from Combat Evolved to Two, which is Halo First Strike. Boys and girls. Our Spartans are back. Yeah, uh, so it's really this is this was a fun book. It definitely a lot going on, and I'll be honest, I've known a lot about this book. I read some summaries. I know, like, I knew about what Operation First Strike was, but I had never actually read it before this. So it was really cool uh, seeing Eric return, which we'll talk about here in a minute, to give us a really cool story. Yeah, I I I love his writing style, and it, and it really shows through in this. After he you know got his chops wet with the first one, had a mm-hmm. little break. And then was able to, as we're going to get to, connect Halo 1 and 2. Yeah, and and what you had said, we were talking about this, is you almost, and by all means, don't do this, but you could not read the flood and basically get what's going on for the most part because they really do that thing where they kind of throw in a sentence here and there that kind of fills you in on the main plot points of, of what happened in the flood and combat evolved, essentially. Yeah, because with the flood, you were getting just a really amazing, I'm not even saying retelling, but it is a retelling of what happened with it, mm-hmm. but also different ODST's points of view, mm-hmm. different Covenant point of view. So I th- that in and of itself was a fantastic story, but this one was kind of the first for me after, obviously after the fall of Reach, but first that kind of expanded out yeah. what, you know, what are they doing and understanding that there are still Spartans like it was, it was the first intro to that. There's still Spartans out there. Yeah, and which is still, you know, if you've never read a book up until five, you would have 
gone under that assumption that Chief was like the quote last Spartan, which mm-hmm. is we've all realized not true for many, many years. So to talk about it, Halo First Strike is the third book in the Halo universe and Nyland's second Halo book. It was released on December 2nd, 2003 on Delray Books and contains 340 pages. First Strike acts as the bridge between Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2. It it does it well. Mm-hmm. We all remember Eric Nyland. He came back or, you know, he was the writer for uh, Halo The Fall of Reach. He really set the tone for the Halo universe and um, it was just really cool having him come back. When it came to writing this book, he was actually kind of hesitant, which really surprised me because at the time they were developing Halo 2 story. Mm-hmm. So he had to go off of the lore he established for Halo Reach uh, or the fall of Reach. He had to go off of the new lore they were, they were establishing for 2 along with the lore that had kind of been established in the Flood. And they had to tell him, you need to link that story to this story as well as as we had mentioned. Yeah, and, and everything that he helped write within the Halo Bible. And as that mm-hmm. continued to expand, it's like pure canon, plus the canons developed, plus the canon's going to be developed for this one, and mm-hmm. how do we get that stuff to match up? Yeah, he actually said about it, quote, there were more events and characters to link and keep track of. Timelines to sync up, like threading three needles at once with one hand. But it was kind of cool that he was given 16 weeks to write this novel compared to the seven that he was given to uh, write The Fall of Reach. So he definitely took this opportunity to fine-tune things that the fans didn't like, including the military aspects of the book. Uh, Something I also really like is he actually read military combat manuals along with uh, biographies of real-life soldiers to kind of get more of that tone and that's actually, I think he might have gotten that idea because we'll, we'll like talk about that, how they actually kind of also did that in Halo 2. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely cool to see that like Bungie and even the, the, the authors for Bungie were really looking at what people didn't like and fixing it. I think that was, that's great. Well, and, you, and that's one of the great things you can do when you have a franchise where, because most people, obviously, you hope you have one success. You're just like, I hope this game does well. We'll build mm-hmm. a bit of lore we can, and we'll hold on to stuff that is potential. And then when it blows up, and it's one of the best-selling games of all time, especially for mm-hmm. Xbox, it's like, cool, let's expand out and really invest the time and money into mm-hmm. doing this. Yeah, so with that, we're going to now do what we always do for the books, give you a pretty pretty good summary of the book itself not going to every little detail but definitely leave enough to where we're going to make you want to read this book because i think that's something i like hearing so far is that people have been saying they listen to this episode or you know and now they want to go and they're reading the book or like this made me more interested into the expanded lore beyond the games and a book like this helps a lot i think it really does justice to make you want to go back and read the fall of reach and read the flood and read everything else that's going to be released from here on out yeah because when i reread this i mean like i said i haven't read this since i was a kid Mm -hmm. um it was really cool to be like oh yeah that's how the connection happens you know this is this and we have some introduction of characters that we see in halo 2 and this is the first time that we're kind of getting a glimpse on a a tiny bit of their backstories Mm -hmm. which is awesome yeah, so let's go into what happens, which it, of course, since Eric writes it, I like the idea that he, the book starts back in the invasion of Reach. Mm-hmm. We see whenever they learn that they have to turn around and they're not going on their mission anymore to go capture the prophet, all of a sudden, planet Reach is being invaded by the Covenant. So the teams have to break off. Uh, Linda and John have to go uh, in separate group. And then Red Team have to go down to the planet of Reach itself and defend those uh, those kind of batteries, right? Yeah, or, for the Mac guns. Yeah, and which we learn, you know, of course, doesn't happen. But it's cool to see that they split off and as Fred's team is going down they're basically getting shot down. Yeah, so so with the start of it, uh, Chief is, you know, handing out his roles, and Fred immediately is like, you know, I'm going to go to the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Kelly's the first, because obviously she's the fastest. Yeah, so she, she's like, she's like I, I volunteer. He's like, uh-huh. nope, it's me and these two. Uh, you guys go groundside. And everyone assumes that they have soft duty. Yeah. Because they're like, we're going to the ground. That's where we fight combat. We're not in zero G. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so Fred gets elected uh, to lead Red Team, because he's basically... John's second in command has always mm-hmm. had. He's like, you're basically me, just not as good. No, what what don't they say? Not as lucky. Yeah, yeah. So, so and I always I liked that detail that everyone was like bummed that they weren't going to go on the hard mission. They mm-hmm. didn't want the sandbag mission, 
But yeah, so as they go to the surface, they get shot down. Uh, Fred has to think on his feet and get everyone to brace the landing. And I like that they basically find themselves on the ground. A, a few Spartans have died, a few are injured, and they have basically no weapons. Yeah, because they basically did an ODST jump mm -hmm. with no pod. Yeah, and so it just describes like the worst pain they'd ever experienced. Everyone has a broken something. Everyone's Ruptured bleeding. spleen, yeah. arms backwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a cartoonish Looney Tunes results <laughs> yeah. of jumping off a mountain. And I like is how they get weapons is they literally throw like they throw rocks at jackals and kill them that way or at least like get them down which imagine it's like a five star athlete with the greatest genetics on earth c combined with a gorilla throwing a baseball at you like you're you're pretty much screwed at that point. Well yeah and it harkens back to their training on reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they because they they get that nostalgic feel because of course again I like that Eric's referencing back to his novel which I think is really really cool about how they were in the forest and mm -hmm. they had to do the same thing. And so then they uh, they find a they find Charlie Company and they're very surprised because they're like where's uh where's your team and they're like this is us. Like and it's like uh the ground is a lot worse than you think. Like this is done. And then that's when we see uh, Admiral Danforth Whitcomb. He gets on the comm. And I love these little details that he says his rank on the comm. And, and it, if anyone's listening, you are you just put the biggest target on your head. Like, I like little things like that. Where, and, of course, uh, he, he redirects their mission. You know, Fred says, hey, listen, like, this is our current mission. He says, not anymore. Like, you're coming with me. You're escorting these guys back to me. So Fred sends uh, basically the rest of what is Red Company. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think it was, like I said, two or three KIAs. Yeah, something like that. Uh, it, it, it was it was the most loss of Spartan life at the time. Yeah, in any battle. That isn't a battle mm -hmm. yet, basically. So Fred takes Kelly and Joshua, which is 029, on a mission to destroy a large Covenant camp in a valley, which is near... Uh, where Charlie Company once was. Mm -hmm. So he's like, we're going to take care of this. You guys take these Marines back um, and, you know, back to the hills and retreat back there. And then we'll, you know, we'll establish a base. Yeah. And it, it they go into to describe this like really cool scene. They take some banshees. They're going to go and deliver this new. They duct tape it. They duct tape yeah. it to the banshee. <laughs> they Spartan duct tape it to the banshee. And then in the process, Joshua, he gets canned. Which is never official, but they kind of assume like he he gets uh, shot down and it's just like nothing's coming from his comm. So he's officially, quote unquote, MIA. Exactly. And and this is where we're the first sequence we do see of, OK, Joshua's MIA, mm -hmm. which is going to be a recurring sequence that we kind of learn why they do it mm -hmm. later on in the book. So So he's listed as MIA and... Going back and touching this a little bit, and this is really where I think uh, Nyland shines with a lot of his stuff, is he has Fred describing his team. Mm -hmm. And Joshua was not the fastest, wasn't, you know, the quickest, but he was just great at keeping morale up. Yeah, and not anymore, because your mor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what morale you had just got shot down. Yeah. Uh, they, they do complete the mission, they deliver the bomb, but then, you know, regardless of what they did, it's like these, these batteries or reactors are overrun, and then the glassing starts. And so Fred says... You know, I, I'm like, no, we're not done here. And they kind of you just see them in their banshees uh, go off in the distance. And then this is where now we go to the present mm -hmm. and we see Chief just sitting in that. Uh, we see Chief sitting in that long sword and he's telling Cortana, you need to scan the area, scan the area. And she's just saying she and, and I like this. These little details like this. I love she says there's nothing that's coming back but dust and echoes, which is a halo track. And I was like, cool <laughs> things. I love cool things like yeah. that. You know, like that's so cool. But of course, uh, you know, she's she's getting upset with him because she's like, OK, I scanned. Nothing came back. And he's like, OK, do it again. And she's like, why are we – because he's basically saying, like, listen, if we don't find anything, we're dead in here. I'm going to die in here, and thus you are going to die. Like, we need to get out of here. And she keeps saying, like, listen, th th there's nothing. And he's he's trying to almost say, like, what if someone is out there? He says, like, and they don't want to be found. Like, we, it, that weird kind of thing. Like, we need to find who doesn't want to be found. Mm -hmm. And then they find Covenant instead. <laughs> so And this is also where – uh, we kind of talked about some speculation of it, but uh, where we first start to see that Cortana admits, like, okay, I've got, like, the whole, like, index of Halo in me. I'm feeling kind of off. Like, she's mm -hmm. admitting to herself. She's like, 
I need to get back at it. Like, like I, I just feel off from that. Yeah, and and that comes up throughout the novels. That Chief even says like, she's kind of been different since this. You know, she's got a bunch of forerunner novel, like a, a library of everything in her head. So it's kind of like she's been kind of like thinking about that as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so they they find these these uh, covenant ships and they're hiding from this covenant fleet, and then they f- they notice three you know they find three cryo chambers just floating, and so they one of them is Linda. Uh, she survived. You know, at first we we're just like because I like that we were wondering during the whole time of the flood, like where's Linda and all this. Like we're assuming she was just stuck on the pillar of autumn and it. And it detonated and she's dead. But to find out she actually lived because as the Pillar of Autumn was going to the surface, it ejected all cryopods. Mm -hmm. Uh, We then found the other two. But unfortunately, through a malfunction, uh, the the other people did not survive. So we have Linda back. So as of right there, within the first chapter or first few chapters of the book, we now know that Chief is not the only Spartan left. She's like kind of clinically dead. Yeah, so so she's not dead or alive prior because she's a Spartan and... Once again, it's a sci-fi book. Yeah. So so it's like she's not dead, but she is. But if we cryo her, we can like basically flash clone stuff for her later. So yeah, that's what her the idea or, was. organs that she needs replaced. Mm-hmm. And so then at that point, this is where we start meeting up with more UNSC, correct? Yes. So so what happens is as they they, they find those pods, uh, they discover a pelican and they discover that they open a comms to it and there's a pilot uh, who managed to make it off Halo. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Chief takes the longsword in, and they dock with the pelican, and it's like a shuffling scene, and you're kind of like wondering what's happening, but a man's hand rises out, and Chief gruffly pulls him up, puts a pistol right to his head, and you realize that it's it's Sergeant Johnson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we're... And that, this is like you start learning about the whole, like, whenever you play Halo 2, you're like, how the fuck did Johnson survive? Yeah. And, and he just he just got a pelican and got off the planet. Like, pretty pretty lackluster but I mean it's classified according to him but but it definitely touches on and this is where we first start talking about Chief's like you should be dead Mm -hmm. I watched that video I saw all of you swarmed with flood and Mm -hmm. none of you made it how did you make it and he just said well I I didn't look that delicious yeah it's just kind of like because at the end of the day he really doesn't know either he just made it off and He's not going to worry about some kind of explanation. He's like, I'm, I'm here. I'm safe. Like, yeah. He just gives you a Johnson one liner. He's mm-hmm. like, they didn't like the taste of me. <laughs> and and so, and this is where Chief just keeps pressing him. He's like, mm-hmm. no, what actually happened? And he's like, Chief, if I, if I was one of them, you would know. Like, yeah. I, I think he says I'm 100 percent like human or whatever. Yeah, he's yeah. And even even Cortana's kind of pressing him, but they both know like he has a point. We've seen how these things are. Like, mm-hmm. there's no way he's one and. And Chief does like I like basically like okay I'm gonna keep an eye on you you got to get tested later but like let's let's move on from yeah. this and so this is where so as they start they pull him out and they start pulling everyone else this is our dream team we get through the book mm-hmm. and I think this goes back to we talked about Nyland researching like diaries of soldiers and mm-hmm. accounts and stuff like that because it kind of applies to a lot of these people because we get Sergeant Johnson first we get an ODST uh, Corporal Locklear. We get warrant officer Sheila Pulaski, who was our pilot that we contacted, and then we also have an O and I lieutenant, Elias Haverson. Yeah, and I like that we we start to actually learn more about these characters, and we start getting emotionally attached to these characters. Mm-hmm. That's something that I really really like that was established, you know, not only in the Fall of Reach but the Flood. Is again, we're getting these characters that were like, I like this guy, I like what they're thinking, or you know, the the rhyme to their reason. So, so this is the point where they're trying to to leave the Pelican. Uh, you said, like, we, we had kind of talked earlier about some crazy kind of over-our-head sci-fi stuff happening, and they kind of slingshot around... Uh... Yeah, so they basically use the gravity of a close-up planet to kind mm-hmm. of slingshot them, too, because they've come to the realization, like, hey, we got to get to Earth, mm-hmm. but this Pelican and this Longsword don't have... Hyperspace generators. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're like, well, that Covenant ship does. Yeah, that one. And of course, <laughs> and at this point, it's never been heard of, like, to take a ship. Like, mm-hmm. the second they get close, the ship detonates. Like, so th- this is going to be a first if they can pull this off. But they do end up getting on the ship. And they, don't they, they, you know, as they're going through and killing a bunch of the, the Covenant, don't they end up kind of suffocating a lot of them? 
they take the oxygen out or like whatever the covenant breathes yeah, and yeah. suffocates them. Yeah, so they have like a bunch of really cool firefights and they're kind of like specking it through and it's just it's where you kind of they get you the introduction of I think everyone's combat prowess because you mm-hmm. see like who's good with a weapon, who's good with this. Um and then once they make it to the bridge and do it, they basically start jettisoning like all the chambers to obviously like kill off whoever's, you know, stowaways basically at that mm-hmm. point. Yeah, and and again, we <laughs> this is almost like a repeat of like what Nylon likes to do is have Chief go one on one with an elite mm-hmm. and have like and this is this is some little gripes I have. Like I feel like this scene was kind of drawn out. We have a one on one fight with Chief and it's like, listen, played combat evolved. I just have to shoot him and and melee him a few times. This is unrealistic, Eric. Play play the game. No, 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 I'm, no, I'm kidding. No, no. Here's here's what I like. Here's and here's why I think that scene's included. So the scene Jesse's talking about is basically um, you know, a black armored elite comes up to Chief and like they're pretty much out of out of ammo at that point. Like mm-hmm. and like you know, Chief pulls a trigger and he's got like a three round burst and that's it. Mm-hmm. So he, he like is holding the gun like a, a you know but like a uh, baton. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and uh and so this elite, and like I said, this is kind of a thing that Nyland brings up, and, and it's just something we know, is the elites want more of that, like, battle, like, hardiness, and mm-hmm. want that, like, I am the champion victor. So he has a plasma pistol, and he throws it to the side and pulls out his energy sword, because he wants to do hand-to-hand combat. So I, I, that's why Nyland includes that, and just includes the struggle of, like, Chief, you're still human, you're Spartan, but, like... It's still a tough fight when you don't have a weapon. Yeah, and with the help of uh, Johnson and Locklear, he he does end up defeating it. He takes mm-hmm. some damage, but yeah. overall, like we get through and we we kill this elite. And at that point, the Ascended Justice enters slip space, and now they're at another place. And now everyone's like, okay, what's next? And Chief suggests that they Chief is still on about this mission from the fall of Reach itself. He's like, hey, um, I'm supposed to go to the Covenant homeworld and capture a leader. And they're just like, what is your problem? No. And everyone else wants to go back to Earth, which and this explains why in the flood they wanted to take that Covenant ship back to Earth. Um, They're all like, let's take this back to Earth. And Cortana says, no, that's part of the cold protocol. You can't. And everyone's like. We've never heard of it. And she said, it's a technicality because no one has ever captured a yeah. Covenant ship. So, like, you're not going to hear about it because it's like a, a big what if one in a million chance. So I like that that was clarified. Like, no one's really ever has heard of it. Like, mm-hmm. that's why they now can't. Like, okay, so we can't go back to Earth. We're not going to go and try to co- uh, capture this Covenant leader. What's next? And... This is when Chief's like, well, let's go to Reach. Yeah, because so Haverson's basically Chief's kind of, you know, little button heads with him because mm-hmm. he's the O&I, he's the highest ranking member there. And so he's like, we need to go back to Earth to debrief you. Mm-hmm. Like, you all have knowledge about Halo, we have to do that. And so that's when Chief and him were battling back and forth. Yeah. No, I need my mission. So then Chief's like, well, let's compromise. Let's go back to Reach. Yeah, like, let's do this thing, and and everyone knows they're like, we know why he's going back. Yeah, it's it, it. Someone mentions it. Like, listen, if I was in your position, I get it, because he wants to go see if Blue Team's alive. Which mm-hmm. even though, when when the Covenant get their eyes on a planet, once they get through and they start glassing it, there's no surviving it. But Chief is still, and every everyone's kind of like, I understand. Like, the, it's a one in a, a trillion chance that they're alive, but. It's his family. He can't not go and check. And so that's when they decide, okay, let's let's make our way back. And so, yeah, at that point, then we see ourselves going back to Earth. And I think within the books and even in the lore, is this the first time within the Halo franchise it's brought to Earth? Am I correct? Yes, because every, yeah. everything else is either at another, like, O and I secret facility mm-hmm. or it's on reach or it's uh, an outer colony or yes. something so yeah this is the first time that we're finally in earth in the lore and we're in sydney at highcom mm-hmm. uh, the 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 big big base and so we have a uh, lieutenant wagner and he's talking to the unsc security council and he's giving them the update on like listen reach is reach is gone we're screwed like we can't take this back like we did harvest like 
they sent so many people there because I think they knew the magnitude of a planet like that. It was our military stronghold. Mm -hmm. And something that Alex and I were texting about, and I have to bring it up, is uh, this book is narrated by Tom McLarlin. And (laughs) so we, 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 we meet Hood for the first time, Mm -hmm. who in the game is voiced by Ron Perlman. And I had to really like double, triple, not check, but keep listening. Cause all of a sudden when Hood starts talking, he's Scottish. And I instantly texted Alex and I was like, man, uh, this guy is doing like a perfect Sean Connery impression. And then when you, when you were going back and revisiting the book, you sent me uh, like a quote, like I'm, I'm Lord Admiral Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's funny. I, I liked it because I don't think they had maybe established yet that Lord Hood would just have a regular American accent. Oh yeah. Like, like we were, we were talking about before is like when you, when you do any audio stuff like this, you probably just mm-hmm. get gruff man, uh, he's, you know, like suave, but he's like hard, like, okay, I'll do this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we also see there again, we see Ackerson because, mm-hmm. you know, originally Colonel his, James Ackerson, this dick, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he was supposed to be reassigned to the front line, but he wiggled his way out somehow. And now he's, he's back on the, the high com, uh, the security council. And we kind of, I like that they hint at this this project he's working on this almost like backup mm-hmm. and we don't know anything else because they really describe in this book they make him they make Ackerson seem like this 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 predator like they describe how he looks into someone like he looks through them and just makes them feel cold like I really like they really villainize him in this book because he is kind of a villain like yeah. he's a dick well and, and I think they establish our general like respect for Hood before we meet him mm-hmm. because you know he they're talking about what should be done, and the report of uh, about Reach is like everything was destroyed except for the Pillow of Autumn, which we don't know anything about because it was mm-hmm. classified as like three and above, so it was like you know secret ops type thing. But so it goes back to him. He's like, good, you know, I'm glad that all those freaks were taken care of, so we can mm-hmm. actually get to doing this as yeah, a war. Yeah, he's back to he's like he's done because you know he his funding can now be more focused, or he can get the funding that was more focused on the Spartans, and of course he's just like. Screw the screw the Spartans. They're weak. They're freaks. And this is where Hood steps in. Yeah, because Hood steps in and he defends them. He's like, you know, I, I've checked their numbers and I know these Spartans and I would trust them over like two platoons of ODST mm-hmm, for yeah. like their kill counts and what they can do. Yeah, this is where he just he he multiple times tell Ackerson just like just can it like I'm done. You don't get to speak anymore. And then this is when another general kind of says, you know, maybe we should go to look for these survivors and this is a time where Ackerson just freaks out on him and like literally asks like are you brain damaged mm-hmm. like he's just like no he like he literally says like you can't come back until you get a medical evaluation like yeah. he's literally like after this go get a medical evaluation how dare you even try to consider going back which is garbage as Ackerson is it's still the smartest play because mm-hmm. as we've known before the covenant glass everything they don't like you know they don't leave something there to stay so it's like listen they've glassed it and they probably still have a small patrol around there if we ever show up it ends with their saying okay the reach has fallen we need to figure out what to do from here on out because at this point earth is really all that's almost left i can't i can't run off the top of my head if there's one or two other ones i know that reach was the most important colony next to earth because now we just have the motherland that's almost defenseless because Reach was the military home for the UNSC. Yeah, and and Earth, they describe in this a little bit, does have like these like battle stations outside of it. But mm-hmm. like w- what we're going to learn later in the book is if a large enough Covenant force were to ever attack, would we be able to defend it? Yeah, uh, and <laughs> no, not really. Yeah. If, if you played Halo 2, spoiler, doesn't work yeah. as easily as you'd think. So now we're kind of going again back in time, back to uh, Fred and Kelly on Reach. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is after they had destroyed that base. They land, or the, you know, they kind of crash landed their Banshees uh, facing a pair of Hunters. And I liked that kind of battle scene. That was really cool. Yeah, it was neat, because I think Fred took some damage and smoking. So they had to like deep dive down because they started to get some turret fire for some other stuff around. 
Mm -hmm. And yeah, like they crash down and she gracefully jumped out of her banshee and lands and his like tumbles and he flies out. (laughs) I think that kind of like sums up because like anything that she does is very graceful. Yeah, because because I because she uses her banshee. So to start like the two hunters are there and Fred's like, fuck. She's like, she's like, (laughs) she's like, get down. And she's like riding on top and like launches it into him and jumps out and obliterates one of the hunters with her banshee. Yeah, really cool scenes like that are within Eric's writing. I do, I do like stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then afterwards, it, it, it's it's almost like you're playing like this badass game of multiplayer like invasion. Because yeah. then they steal a pair of wraiths. Yep, wraith tanks, and then they just go and they start blasting their way, and they're going to uh, to castle base. And so it just cool stuff like that where you just like you really start seeing that like what within the lore the stereotypical Spartan would be to the general public. That's what they are. They're just these badass killing machines just taking whatever they can get and just killing everything in their sight. Yeah. I, one of uh, Nyland's descriptions with it. They're talking about they took the, the wraith tanks and uh-huh. obviously the jackals and grunts and everybody around that is like they're not really paying attention to it. And then when the tanks are to fire on them. They freak out, and there's a part where just Fred runs over just like 10 grunts in a row just with his tank. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, yep, that's about right. <laughs> it's literally like it's like you're playing a campaign on easy. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> so they after all this, they meet up with uh, Delta Team, a uh, group of Spartans. Yeah, because uh, they're trying to figure out like where everybody is, and they're like, okay, they're they're digging because they, they, they notice that there's like this digging tools mm-hmm. by this mountain. And they're like, why is the Covenant have all these digging tools and tech and yeah. all this stuff? And that's when, as they get a signal, that, hey, there's actually someone in there. Yeah. That they use both those wraiths and just start blowing that equipment away. Yeah. They're just like, well, let's get rid of this. And uh, we also see Halsey again yeah. with, with all these uh, Spartans that they, they exactly. So so, so after they they make it out, they escape their their wraiths and they blow some banshees out of the sky. They get reintroduced to her. Uh huh. Yeah, and, and realize that she's still there. Yeah, it's and it's really cool that they. She's at this. She's she's in this lab in this mountain, and then she like it's it's going through a lot. We we find out that basically Kelly and Fred are as we had described, literally broken bones, like broken ribs, all this stuff, like internal bleeding. But basically, just says you guys are still okay to do your job, and they're just like cool because that's. What they're bred to do is basically just get beaten half to death and <laughs> not flinch. Yeah, and somehow be okay. Because she was like, if you were regular people, you both would have been dead by now. Yeah, from like even just the shock alone would have just shut them down. Mm-hmm. And so we also notice that she's starting to go through these files at one point. And I like that they literally say like some uh we find like uh Ackerson's files we're mm-hmm. we're referencing back to Ackerson and we're finding about some kind of program that program that was referenced earlier back on earth we're starting to learn just a little more about that and there's this new AI that says hey if you do this you're in violation like you're going to mm-hmm. be court martialed it's, and, yeah, it's his personal AI yeah and she's literally like there's like we're like earth is <laughs> yeah. doomed like who is going like there's going to be no one alive to even court martial me so like let's go through with it yeah because she realizes when she, when she starts to look through uh, Kelly's bio report and tries to look at her her history she's like weird there's been other inquiries into this and so that's what led her to realize Ackerson's been looking into her Spartans mm-hmm. for a while. Yeah, very interesting considering he, like, hates them. Yeah, and looking into, like, the families they were taken from and, like, their training and all this other stuff. So you're realizing, like, he, as much as he hates them, he's doing deep dive research into he's, all this stuff. He's very interested in mm-hmm. them. And so, yeah, they Halsey gets threatened by this AI and then she figures out, like, she says, uh, she, she gets rid of him, she kills him. Yeah. So after she kills off Ackerson's, her she has a separate AI there that is in Cortana, Calmia. Yeah, it's, it's basically, I think they said it was Cortana's older sister. It's yeah. like the one that she was experimenting yeah. with. And Calmia kind of sees this go down and is like, can you do that to me? Like, I, I like that sense just like, wait, that was a little easy. And, and she's like, can you do that? And she lies and is like, no. And I like how it describes how she, like, you kind of learn, like, Halsey sometimes can be a sociopath because she's she's like, I have to just have this blank tone and this blank expression so this AI can't read my face and tone and know that I'm lying. Yeah, because I she says and it comes up again because we we kind of figure out that as much as the AIs are just code, 
you know, there's there's lines of code, mm-hmm. is that they're treated almost as humans because she goes, I, I can't I can't fully lie to her because yeah. I've earned her trust. Yeah. But I'm not telling her the whole truth. Yeah. And so after this all happens, uh, the Covenant come back and mm-hmm. are invading once again. So they're in this, they're in a mountain and the Covenant are coming. So you're just like, shit, 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 as you're reading this. Yeah, because so the base they have uh, used to be an old mine shaft. Mm-hmm. And then Oni or Oni took it over and just made it their base at yeah. some point. So they're, they're deep in this mountain. Yeah, and so they have to escape. Eventually, Fred and Kelly get new armor. Yes. So it's it's cool to see we get this little little upgrade. We're also starting to see more stuff from Halo 2. We see the BR and mm-hmm. the new pistol that the top you know, that top of the line thing. Yeah, that one that uh no one really liked cuz it couldn't take out 101 shot in the back. Yeah. Well, it, it was really good description they they did cuz when they went and got the new armor and everything they went to this this armory with footlockers and stuff. And they're discovering all these weapons like where have these been? These are amazing. And, like, getting all this, like, new tech that they're, like, discovering that O and I had. Yeah. And then at that point, uh, Fred finds this, uh, this, this crystal. And, and this crystal is a huge thing within the plot of this book. Mm -hmm. And this, it's, it's a huge source of frustration for me because as Alex and I were texting about this, I was like, there's a lot of confusing sci-fi stuff that goes on in this book. And this crystal, it, it, you find out it bends space and time around it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's confusing to me. Yeah. So so it's it's the main reason the covenant didn't glass the entire planet mm-hmm. and they the, left this here. Yeah. They realize as we get through uh, bits and pieces of different um, story arcs, we'll we'll touch on that. This is basically the holy the holiest of holy relics they've found. Yeah. And whenever they were trying to escape that mountain, they came to this room and they realized they're like, are we? Are we moving? And it's like, yeah, because like, like the room was separating, and they're like, no, we've, we're standing still, but we're getting further apart. Yeah. So, so that's when they first learn that it's like bending space. It's, re- time. it's basically like shrooms without having to eat the shrooms. <laughs> exactly. Like this is like the this kind of like a win win for anyone who wants to go on a trip Check without it. eating nasty shrooms. Got to find a sweet mountain crystal. <laughs> uh, and then one thing I want to touch on going back just just a little bit uh, was with Fred. So Fred, when he first gets into the wraith tank. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously all the controls, like he describes them, he's like, are they like Egyptian hieroglyphics or just like alphabet soup or noodles? Yeah. Like, and then he's like, but they're familiar. And he like, is like, okay, that turns it on. That moves it. That does this. And then the same thing happens when they get to the room of the crystal. He like yeah. puts his hand on it and like, you know, gets through the passage and everything is like, I recognize this yeah it's 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 always odd because that's what happened in the flood Mm -hmm. remember with those controls like chief sees them and he's like this is oddly alien but so oddly familiar yeah because china's like how did you know to do that he's like yeah i don't know Uh, something i like and this was back in the beginning of the book whenever they stole those banshees Mm -hmm. fred says that some message popped up and he just clicked something to send a message back. And he said, like, five more messages instantly appeared. And he's like, well, that didn't work. Like, I love little <laughs> yeah. things like that. Like, all of a sudden, like, five more popped up. Like, wait, who are you? And people are like, nope. We're, Never mind. We're, yeah. Yeah, so it's definitely uh, this this kind of crazy thing that goes on with this crystal that we'll talk about more and more. And so they take the crystal with them. And they have Kelly lead. They're like, you know what you're doing. Like, you are you can lead us. And they're following her. And it's all trippy, mushroomy, as we talked about. Yeah. And they make their way into this large cavernous room. They're like, man, there's so much stuff down here. And then they, they, they halt. And they hear the sound. And like then they see it. This beam of plasma comes through and just basically bores a huge hole through, right through the mountain to where that room is. Yeah. And then they see this purplish glow beam come through. And they realize, oh, that's, you know, that's a gravity lift. Yeah. Like, they're coming. Like, Everyone find cover. Yeah. And then it, it gives us that suspense because then now it goes back and we're back to Master Chief and Cortana. Mm-hmm. So they, it, I like that this book jumps around like the flood did and really starts to build that suspense. Like, we're seeing something about to happen. And then now we're on to someone else. And what's weird is, if you haven't noticed so far, we were in the past. Yeah. With both, when we're learning about them doing the dropship mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. so so all that's in, in the before Halo, as we want to call it. Yeah. And, and so we're, we're kind of connecting up. Yeah. So we're kind of going from the past to the present to back to the past. So it's really cool. 
and it, 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 Nyland does it well to where it's not confusing by yeah. any means because you 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 can tell what's going on when it's going on. But yeah, so now and, and something we jumped the gun on is that when it goes back to Chief and Cortana, that's when they actually find that uh, one of the cryo tubes is Linda. I know uh, we we had talked about it earlier, but at this point is when they say, "Oh, okay." This is Linda. Cool. Now we have her back. Mm-hmm. We were just very excited because Linda's back in our hearts. Yeah. And then we also learned that the other Marines had died due to uh, some malfunctions within the cryo tubes. And so, so something I do want to mention, this little detail that I really like, is like we keep seeing the engineers. Mm-hmm. And so at one point, one one goes and fixes Chief's, uh, like I think it's battery, or he fixes something on the yeah, Mjolnir yeah, armor. Yeah, because what happens is when they're first attacking... Um, his shield battery just stops working. Yeah. So, so when we have that fight, and this goes back to that Nyland fight with that uh, elite, mm-hmm. Chief didn't have a shield at the time. Yeah. So he was fighting basically just in the armor. Yeah, and that's why he gets damaged, and he makes a note like, "Oh my god, I've I rely on this now." Mm-hmm. And so this this uh, this engineer works on his armor and makes his way. I think there's only two at the time. And so, and I, the character escapes me, but a character walks up to the engineer, and they've all established, because we've seen the engineers prior, and they've all established, we don't have to kill these guys, they're friendly, like, they literally just want to fix stuff. Yeah. And so this engineer gets shot in the head, and I think his Cortana's like, what are you doing? And then this person says, they don't have a side, but they'll answer to anyone. So you realize you gave this engineer access to the most important armor in the UNSC, and the, the the person even had to say again, their name escapes me. I think I think it was Locklear. Uh, yeah, was, okay. Thinking back, I think it was Locklear yeah. because. So we learn a little bit earlier that when they do board the ship, they're like, Cort- "Chief, like Cortana, can you speak to this engineer? Can you tell him that we want to fix the ship and do yeah. it?" Yeah. And then whenever she, like he's the engineer was cowering, and then when she's like, "Oh, we want to fix the ship," he's like. Oh, okay, cool. I'll follow you. Yeah, like has no allegiance except for like two toward technology. Yeah, but then at that point, Locklear is like, "Listen, like, and Locklear, we're not. I, I didn't want to have to do this, but like, if if for some reason this engineer would have gotten back to the Covenant, this is now so much more insight, and now they can improve their own shields. The, yeah, and so it's like that weird kind of thing where Cortana was even like, "Oh, like he's absolutely right," and like kind of that morality thing, like this sucks, but I had to shoot this innocent creature just because it it touched Chief mm-hmm. and just got a small insight into his shield. And so at that point, like after, like I, I just loved that scene. I, I wanted to bring up that because uh, it was just really kind of a sad scene because the engineers are are pretty neutral. They just really just want to help fix things. Yeah, I think I think they're just uh, like like grunts. They're mm-hmm. kind of just more of like an enslaved race overall. Yeah, yeah. That they really don't have any say with it. And mm-hmm. then they kind of just want to build stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so moving on, we find ourselves going back to Reach. Uh, we, we made it. Yeah, we, we made it there. And of course, at first, everyone's like, well, uh, it's a glass rock mm-hmm. until all of a sudden they're like, wait, there's one little section that is not glass. Like what's going on here? And someone's like, oh, they missed it. And they're just like, no, 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 no. Like they don't miss. They don't miss. They do the whole planet. They they completely destroy it. So so now they know like, OK, clearly something's going on there. Why is it going on there? So now we have to go and make our way there. And I like that, and it's a reference back to their training, that they get this kind of, tra- they get this uh, message mm-hmm. from Reach, and we hear Ali Ali Oxenfree. Yeah, so it's basically, it's a it's a tone to start. So it's like, Ali Ali Oxenfree, but in tones. Mm-hmm. And to answer you, Ali Ali Oxenfree, all is free, we are free. Mm-hmm. And we understand that, like, and this and this is where we then go to a flashback on reach when the spartans are training Mm -hmm. that the spartans use this code to say hey like this is us like yeah only spartans know this code and only these only only these specific ones we'll say that because obviously as we get further along in different books and games this is that specific class of john Mm -hmm. master chief's class yeah that they they recognize this and so chief knows like okay like they're good. Like we need to. We need to go. Yeah, because at that same point, all these other Covenant ships that are still around Reach are like, "Why the hell are you here?" Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so Cortana's like jumping in and like trying to translate and being like, "Yeah, they're saying like there's some like 
crazy holy person on this ship or like something like some really important yeah, person kind of just bullshitting yeah and so Cortana's like yep it's us and everyone's like okay cool <laughs> your boys yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they're like ah cool welcome yeah so they make their way down to that cave and chief chief goes out with a few other odst and yeah, so, so goes out with the odst uh-huh. goes out with pulaski because she was learning how to fly a covenant dropship yeah. So they were trying to go like as undercover as they could. Yeah, and this is where we see uh, Anton 044 for the first time. Chief's automatically relieved that he's seeing the you know a, at least a Spartan that's walking around, mm-hmm. like able-bodied, someone who can talk to him. Yeah, and so this is so he's found Anton. Anton leads him back. So so their their drop location wasn't at that mountain yet. We're gonna get there with um, mm-hmm. the other Spartans that we were talking about with with uh, the doctor. That we are now at the fallback location where Admiral Whitcomb is. And this is where we meet Grace, 0093, and Lee, 008. And they lead him in and, you know, they're trying to... It's at Camp Independence, so it's it's the setup that they have for that. And this is where kind of we... Chief has to... uh, We see Admiral Whitcomb that we met in the beginning of the book. And we... Chief has to give him kind of debriefing of like... Halo. Everything that mm-hmm. happened, Halo, the flood, that whole Reach thing. All that. Yeah, so it was it was kind of like again these little things that are like if you didn't read the flood, like they fill you in on some of this stuff. And what I really like is, I, you start to really like Whitcomb at the at the beginning. You're like, who is this stupid ass like you know higher yeah. up trying to grab these Spartans? But then you're like, I love. He's like, if I had heard that from anybody else. I thought you're a liar. Yeah, but I heard it from you, Chief. Yeah, so he like you kind of realize like this guy actually like has a head on his shoulders. Like mm-hmm. he's just not some big power hungry general, and he has respect for the Spartans. Like mm-hmm. every decision he makes is for a very specific, calculated reason. So I I, I do get that. Like, and we also learn that a uh, red team is still in the mountain. This is where Chief is first. Like, oh shit! Like my my best buds. Yeah, like, y'all are my buds, but I'm looking for my best buds. Where are they at? Yeah, and and then finally, I think Whitcomb is. Because they asked, Chief's like, why didn't you leave? Like, why mm-hmm. did you stay here and not evacuate with everybody else? And he's like, well, you know, I had to stay behind because they're working on a new bomb called the Nova, uh, which possesses the explosive force to destroy a planet. So it's basically nuke yeah. on top of nuke on top of nuke. Mm-hmm. And he's like, we were going to use it to basically destroy the Covenant home planet. Yeah. So it's really cool. You're starting to see all these like kind of different missions on like what we're trying, these countermeasures against the Covenant. Yeah. And, and so he... Chief's like, yeah, you know, I would have done a 14-day timer on that. And he's like, oh, yeah. I did a 10-day. And like, so they're having like this cool like back-and-forth military uh-huh. talk. And they're like, yeah. how much time do we have? He's like, eh, 20 hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at that point, um, they, they make their way into the cave at this point to look for Red Team, correct? Yeah. So so they, they head out that way, and they discover, you know, how to get down there. How they make their way into this cave is actually really, really creative uh, because— uh, Alex and I had talked about this earlier is is we had uh, this uh, dropship that they had used to get down to the planet. Mm-hmm. So they used that to get close to that beam that had bored into the mountain. And they, they're using, what, like rockets and fuel rod cannons. Yeah, so, so they, they dropped in the grav lift that they created to drop mm-hmm. you know, other soldiers. And they dropped down, and they dropped down a distance away because Whitcomb's like, hey, we can't risk losing this dropship. It's our way out, mm-hmm. and we're going to surprise them. And Chief's like, Hell yeah, that's cool. <laughs> You're kind of smart, actually. <laughs> Again, smart. we're, we're yeah. learning Wickham's kind of a very calculated guy. Yeah, we realize that he's he's kind of like a keys in that he does very, like, not by the book stuff. Unconventional. Very unconventional yeah. stuff. And Chief's like, okay, that's what we needed. So you've got the drop force. Uh-huh. So you've got the the Spartans we brought back from the other base. Yeah. Uh, plus some of our, our ODSTs and all this other stuff. So they, mm-hmm. you've got some uh, captured... Fuel rod cannons, and yeah. then you've got some rockets being fired in as the chief and a, and a small unit sprint forward to get to closer combat and to get close to those uh, Spartans that are there. Yeah, and then you know once they once they get in, they make their way through all the enemies, which I say is like mainly grunts uh, clearing out the cave. Mm-hmm. And this is where uh, we are reunited with Kelly and Fred and Will, but also Doctor Halsey meets back up with Chief. It's kind of like this this homecoming. Yeah, that, that was a powerful scene because it uh-huh. really brings up that Halsey's like, hi, John, how are you? And John was like, 
I should have corrected her, but I can't. Like, yeah, because she's the only one that that addresses the Spartans by their names. Yeah, it doesn't mm-hmm. use their their rank or their their mm-hmm. number. Yeah, she's the only one, and because you start to see that kind of uh, that mother figure, mm-hmm. and so all of a sudden, like, oh, this is this is cool, a little family meet, like reunion, whatnot, and then all of a sudden, shit hits the fan. Yeah, because so so they, they they had that great battle. They murdered all the covenant around, uh-huh. and they start to hear and kind of see stuff. And they realize that there's like it's almost like an amphitheater. Like there's like seating almost. Yeah, like, like different like balconies. Rows. Yeah, like it's almost you know like Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or something. Yeah. So imagine like that scene or like you know like any of the Star Wars like council scenes. Yeah. And there's just like tears and tears of every type of covenant going uh-huh. almost all the way up to that hole. Yeah, and they just all of a sudden get surrounded. And something that sticks out is that there's a pair of hunters that see them. And we we, we learn uh, throughout the previous books that these hunters actually have personalities and mm-hmm. like they can they see the Spartans and they know Spartans kill hunters. So all of a sudden the the two hunters raise up their their arms and they fire out they fire at them and then that's where it cuts to black and we go back to the ascended justice in space yes so so cortana has you know she was doing her thing like hey guys what's going on how are you guys doing and then there's ships to come and investigate her yeah she's like oh it's all good it's all good and then she fires her plasma cannons because she realizes as she's going through all of these different computer things that they have for like their plasma turrets and mm-hmm. all those she's like this stuff's archaic yeah like this is like caveman tech that they're somehow py- piloting and she she keeps saying like it's because they're adaptive they're not yeah. innovative yeah they can they they're not like because because we learn like later in the lore spoiler alert they get a lot of their technology from forerunner technology yeah. so it was it, like she starts learning that and she kind of is like trying to dip set out because it's like they're kind of calling her on her bullshit. So then, yeah. at this point, she starts le- listening in on some uh, transmissions coming in from the Covenant. And so she had to deal with this this other voice was in the ship. Yeah. That was basically calling her a heretic. Yeah, and it, it's, it's we learn that they... They, the Covenant have their own AIs, yeah. and their AIs somehow believe the same thing. I don't know if they're programmed that way, if they somehow managed to brain... I, I don't remember how they say exactly, but she's even confused. She's like, really? Like, I'm dealing with a Covenant AI, and it's literally what it is. It believes in the Great Journey as well. Yeah, because she was realizing, she was like, how did that happen? And, and this is why the ships turned on her, was because it kept going heresy. And yeah. she realized it opened all of the channels and called heresy mm-hmm. towards that ship. So that's why the ship started to turn on yeah. her. And she was like, man, I am slipping up. And this is where she brings up again, like, all right, I'm feeling pretty messed up since Halo. Yeah, like, it's, she's almost sh- hung over. Yeah, it's what it kind of, because she's like, I should have checked on that. I just didn't really think about it. Mm-hmm. And so she's kind of fighting this AI while she's also like discovering all this other covenant tech. Yeah. And... Um, well, and so she she tests out her new her new system of plasma on these mm-hmm. ships, kills them, and then goes out of system. Yeah, and, but then at the end of this, again, we're having these more like cliffhangers. Is that Cortana discovers that Covenant forces are trying to head to Earth? Yeah, they know the location of Earth. Like, like it's like, oh shit, this is actually happening. Yeah, she realized that like, oh, they're they're amassing a huge ship, like like navy, basically mm-hmm. in this this uh, system. And she's like, why are, why are they all meeting at this place? Like, what's, what are they doing? And then that's when she realized, like, they're, they're going to Seoul. Yep. Which yeah. is, you know, Earth's universe. Yeah, so it's just like, well, now we have another cliffhanger. And now we go then back down to the surface where those two hunters fired at the group of Spartans and Halsey. Mm-hmm. And we see that uh, Kelly takes the hit. Yeah, she hit her shoulder. Uh huh. And so she's incapacitated. And then at that point, all of a sudden, plasma fire erupts. And, but it, in the the kicker here, mm-hmm. it's all at the hunters. It's because the they have to try to get that that data crystal, and it can be destroyed. Yeah, and, it, and that's what we learn is that the covenant overall, like like this is their sworn enemy, specifically these Spartan humans. Mm-hmm. But they realize, and they kind of hear the chirping that. Like, if anyone else tries to put a shot down there, 
they will be flayed alive. Yeah, like you, it doesn't matter what they do to us. We cannot shoot towards them because it will destroy this crystal. Mm -hmm. So you literally have thousands of Covenant shots going in and just, just, just annihilate this just hunter parrot. Melts because they said it was enough plasma. Even if their shield up, melted through their shield and just uh -huh. melted them. Yeah. So that was, and basically they dip set out. They they get they get a uh, Kelly and they're gone. And uh, so at that point. Wickham signals and uh, Plasky's in that uh, dropship, mm -hmm. and they throw out the. They try to get to the grav lift, but the uh, Covenant pull them back. Yeah, so 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 they're they're reversing the grav lift. They're mm -hmm. reversing it like back down, it's like instead of like. Uh oh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. And so then at that point we see the crystal start to act up once again, be trippy. Yeah, and it's, it's it starts, messing. It starts with, to like light up. Yeah, and it's it starts messing with the grav lift. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, what it does is is they're realizing like. So they reverse the gravity, so like it's the gravity is pushing them like basically back down. So like the gravity mm -hmm. was taking them up before, but it's pushing them back down and make sure it goes that way. And the crystal's like, uh-uh-uh, yeah, and like, just like shoots them up. Yeah, and so again, that trippy kind of stuff that's going on with the uh, the crystal itself. And so now we're uh, back at the Ascended Justice. Cortana's kind of using those engineers to combine the Covenant ship with another ship, the UNSC Gettysburg. And we're kind of seeing this Frankenstein ship. Yeah. So, so basically, what we're, what we're seeing on Cortana's end. So, so they they make it out into mm -hmm. space, and our, our little tiny dropship makes it out into space. Yeah. And they're like, "Okay, chief, let's go to that rendezvous point." And he's like, "Uh, this this is the rendezvous <laughs> point. Uh, we're here. Yeah, we're here." And uh, and so it flashes the Cortana like a, a bit before this this they come out into space. And she's like, "All right, I got some time. I'm going through these systems," and she's kind of harvesting through. These ships, because she's trying to find basically intact warp core. Yeah. Because she, she understands that I need two of them because I can't immediately jump directly into space mm -hmm. and then jump back out with them. I need to have two warp cores to be able to do it. Yeah. And so that's when she makes that gross Frankenstein monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they call it like a, a Gettysburg Ascended Justice. Yeah. Once they get into there, Cortana, you know, they're back in slip space. They need to get out of them. But at that point, this is again kind of sci-fi stuff this crystal puts them in this weird kind of like slip space limbo yeah so so once they're on board they're like we <laughs> we gotta leave like like more ships are showing up here now everyone's turning on us there's no way because i think they still had operationals like six six or five plasma turrets mm -hmm. and they're like we can fight but we can only fight one round basically yeah like one little firefight mm -hmm. and that's when they dip set and then and, and this is especially when i first texted you about this being like this book is weird yeah <laughs> this book is confusing as hell because they're kind of in this this uh like limbo no, I, I love it it's 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 almost like how i how i always looked at it did you ever see um what was the the story of uh noah or moses was it moses the what was the cartoon where he has to part the seas you know I mean, what I'm talking about? It's a cartoon and a Bible thing, but yeah. Yeah, well, I'm seeing the the cartoon they made of that story, like where they part the seas and you see all these ships on the outside. That's kind of like what it almost describes, like this weird like kind of slow-mo stuff going on. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, it really tells the properties of the crystal that not only can it bend space, as we saw on the ground, it's also affecting time. So they're in yeah. slip space, but they're... Not, and they're also realizing that slip space in and of itself mm -hmm. is another dimension, and it's not actually like, like, like shrinking space down. You're actually going to a different dimension, mm -hmm. which time is different, which everything else is different. Yeah. And the one detail I want to bring up, going back just slightly, was when I did say that we were in the past and the future. They talk about that a little bit with when Cortana and Chief were doing things on Halo. It was actually in the future as to where we are now because the crystal was bending time yeah, to it's... make sure that both timelines matched up exactly. So these things were happening concurrently with when Halo was happening. Mm -hmm. Whether it be a writer's way to magically make things work or to make a really cool ass sci-fi thing, yeah. they are actually back in time now. Yeah, it's it's odd, as I said, yeah. and I still don't one hundred percent get it. I know there are people that are. I've done. A, I did a little bit of research outside of it, and just you know, seeing some open discussions and kind of like a lot of people. What you said, kind of like, is this a low hanging fruit or is this something really cool and crazy? Yeah, is it is it an easy plot point to be able to? redirect any mm -hmm. misdirections you had or to make sure that because what they said before uh we didn't really mention this but 
they said that the entire thing from when the Pillar of Autumn fled Reach mm-hmm. to when they found Halo to when they did Halo and blew up Halo and got here was only six days. Yeah, it was kind of this crazy timeline. And and to me, like, granted, sure, like when you're playing Halo, it doesn't feel like it's that many days. Yeah. But you're telling me it only took Chief six days to traverse all of Halo. So I think they use it as a little bit of a loophole saying uh-huh. that that crystal in and of itself corrects time and space when it needs to to like make almost fate happen yeah and so like a few things are happening and it's really cool to see that like the the crystals bending like plasma yeah because it's like there's like almost like a like a bunch of shots being fired in this weird kind of like it's like a space limbo yeah this limbo going on and uh within the process some uh Elites blow a, a blow a hole in the hole of the ascendant justice. Yeah, so so one of the vectors they have to recharge the slip space engine, mm-hmm. um, they realize that some because they still have covenant on their ship. Yeah, they realize that some of them potentially they realize it did. They went out in their little spacesuits, little, little elite spacesuits, and uh, <laughs> like precision cut these these coils to yeah. be, basically disable that. In the process of trying to fix these. Uh, we lose Pulaski, Lee, and Anton. Yeah, so Pulaski volunteers. She's like, I'll fly that dropship out. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're like, the Spartans can handle this. You're okay. She's like, no, I can precision do this. And so, yeah, one of the plasma bolts gets so close that it basically burns the ship. Mm-hmm. Lee was on top kind of doing an overwatch and died. Yeah. And so it's unfortunate. And then Anton was also behind like a... Uh, barrier that was way too close yeah and then kelly also gets uh injured within this process Mm -hmm. and so at the end of all this crazy kind of trippy stuff they end up getting out of that slip space kind of limbo and they leave the covenant in there because they were you know they had followed them in there yeah and then it just decompresses and destroys the the covenant fleet that's in there yeah and so they, they they exit slip space and they realize that time's been distorted and what should have taken, like, basically days took hours. Yeah. And, like, my thing is, if I was ever into slip space, what I would do... Yeah? I'd probably just check out, chill out, listen to a, a book on Audible. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash finish the fight and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs and download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audible.com slash finish the fight to get started today. Why Audible? Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, and entertainers. And that's how Jesse and I listen to First Strike. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I said, with all these books, we've been going through Audible with it. Uh, They have just a great selection of books for Halo specifically going through it. Uh Love the narration. Love the ease on the go. The app makes it simple. And even there's a correlation between the app and the website. So it picks up where you left off. It picks up where you left off. And one of the things I love with the Audible thing is they give you this little courtesy thing where it goes back a little bit. Uh-huh. Whenever you switch to new media. Mm-hmm. So I love it. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash finish the fight. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash finish the fight for your free audiobook. Thank you again, Audible, for sponsoring today's amazing podcast. And so at, at this point, you know, we're we're we we left the the kind of the trippy zone. And we learn about this crystal a little more that it, it's very radioactive yeah uh and that it's going to kill the crew within 72 hours like they need to get it away and they need to like contain it yeah because they were saying like when it's not doing anything it's dormant there's nothing that happens Uh but they realized like how much they were like if we're exposed to this anymore like we're all dead because of the high Mm. radiation from it yeah so they they kind of just get it off the bridge and they're trying to get it as far away from everyone else as possible and then they kind of they they're kind of assessing where they're at, and they realize that they're the uh, Iridanus system. Yeah. And Chief is like, I know that. A little uh, 
little fall of reach action going yeah, on. Yeah, we're, we're fall, again falling back to fall of reach, which I don't mind. I like that Eric's really giving us these insights into his first novel. And he kind of realizes, like, hey, uh, just so you know, uh, I kind of know this area. <laughs> I know that there are know rebels here. Yeah. They know me. They don't like us. Well, actually, they kind of actually say that, like, they never knew that it was Spartans that because came they had the in. armor at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so... He kind of is like, ah, I think we can kind of go in, but that that's kind of like jumping a little bit ahead. Halsey does tell Chief, like, hey, she calls him in, says Linda's going to live. And then as well, kind of we start to figure out a little more about Johnson and how he survived against the flood. Yeah, so going back a little bit with Linda, um, we we get that flash cloning process again as we uh-huh. did in the first book. I mean, and with, with the flood as well, we kind of talked about it. But we realize that she's flesh cloning her organs because I, I assume with all of these, it's just she has other DNA so she can kind of do yeah, it. Yeah, just pull it off a file. Exactly. So just kind of like 3D prints some kidney, 3D prints a lung or two. You know how it mm-hmm. is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just takes those organs. And like you said, this is where Halsey's like, hey, I got some uh, I got some deets. Mm-hmm. got some little deets right here on uh, Johnson. Yeah. And she says that, you know, through exposure from plasma from uh, the Covenant, he has Borden syndrome. Yeah, because he, he threw a bunch of grenades. He, yeah, he, he found like a 12 pack and just <laughs> used them all. They did, I love that they get this very serious moment. You kind of see his cowboy rowdiness. It's yeah. just like, yeah, in this battle, he found a box full of grenades and used every one of them. So you're in the whole time, you're just like, Fuck yeah. Like, yeah. You hear that and you're just like, awesome. And so this is where we kind of, this, this, you know, we kind of learn about some morals. And so Halsey says this and she says, now listen, the second Oni finds out about this, they're going to kill him and dissect him because they want to know how he survived the flood. Yeah. So, so she gives him two ultimatums because she's like, listen, man, this is my atonement for what I've done by mm-hmm. making you decide She's like, it's it's always been sacrifice the few for the many, uh-huh. but she realizes like that doesn't matter, like it really yeah. doesn't. So she gives, she presents Chief two data crystals. Mm-hmm. Both have info on the flood, and the the first one is, here's my report based on all of your guys' stories, basically, mm-hmm. and what we've found from captors and things like that. Our second one now is a full, detailed report on the idea that Johnson was not infected and here's how that structure could work. Yeah, and so then even even Chief is like, he doesn't know what to do either because he's in this weird thing of like, Halsey's to the point where she's just like, I do want to save everyone. Like, you can see that Halsey is just so tired because clearly like she's the only person who truly has not moved on from what happened when the Spartans were children. Well, it's true. And she hasn't brewed, as you learn, a fresh cup of coffee in a while in this book. Yeah. <laughs> she's just she's really kind of mentally checked out yeah. uh with all the morals and these ethics that we're dealing with. And I like that later uh we we see um with the Kilo Five trilogy, but it's really she's just like you need to decide I can't do this anymore. Like, it's up to you. Whatever decision it is, it's probably the right decision. Mm. And now we're left with John to go, well, what the hell am I doing then? Yeah, and and going back to Johnson, this is where... I brought this up a little bit and if we could survive the flood because I know I can. This is where we first learn of Born syndrome. Yeah. And, and we don't really know anything about it yet. We just know that it's high radiation from plasma and a, uh-huh. like, like the perfect cocktail of radiation and plasma and being a cool badass. Like it's yeah. all kind of like, 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 like kind of like numbs and nullifies the nervous system. Kinda, yeah. 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 Because he's like he's like so he's like Chernobyl. But like, okay, Chernobyl. <laughs> He's like fine. <laughs> yeah. He's perfectly fine. Yeah. And so we, we go back to then like like they need uh they need repairs on their ship. Yep. And so they're like, listen, we can go down to this asteroid belt in the Aridana system and we can meet up with these rebels. Like they've been hiding here, we know they're there. Let's just risk it. And mm-hmm. so then they get in touch with Governor Jacob Giles, right? Mm-hmm. And so they kind of do this kind of fake out where they're both kind of at a standstill. Like, well, I can blow you up. Well, I can blow you up. And yeah. Then- yeah. I love that Whitcomb is just so kind of military, militaristically brutal. He's like, mm-hmm. hey, guys, what's going on? Um, we're coming to your base. 
whether you like it or not, and you're, we're going to repair our stuff. You're going to help us. Yeah. And so they send out like the most garbage of pirate fleets. It's like these decommissioned pelicans with some random chain guns. Mm-hmm. And there was one ship, I forget the name of the ship, but um, our ODST is like, that was that was decommissioned a while back. Like, because yeah. they just failed every other mission. Yeah. And, and Wickham's like, is it dangerous? He's like, there's no weapons on that. Yeah, like, it's it's just kind of this ragtag fleet. And so we start to see, you know, they actually meet up. They meet up mm-hmm. with this general, and he's kind of, at first, was kind of being a dick, but now he's trying to be courteous. And now they're kind of back to being very cautious towards each other. And even, like, when they enter the room, Chief is checking behind curtains and stuff, like, making it very obvious that he doesn't trust them. Yeah, because they're, they're still, they're, they have, like, the civilian or civvy type presence. Like mm-hmm. I love, I love when Giles is like, "Listen, guys, it's chill. Just hang out." He really sit in those does chairs. have that, that like, because they describe him. He has like long hair too. Long hair. He's got a goatee. I think it was ten centimeters or something. Okay, because everything's in centimeters yeah. in these books. <laughs> and so, so they sit in chairs, and then he has like basically a throne with yeah. like with like alcohol and decanters all around. My favorite description ever. And it's it's the most anime description you can find in this book. He sits <laughs> with like his legs. Sorry, I was like doing it in my own chair. He he sits with like his legs slung over the side with like his feet dangling, hanging yeah. out. Like, well, <laughs> welcome guys. What do you want? What's up? Yeah, yeah. And so while they're trying to kind of negotiate some stuff, uh, you find out that uh, the Covenant actually tracked them because of the radiation from the crystal. So the Covenant drop out of nowhere, and they're like, doesn't matter what's going on, just kind of ruins everything that's going on. Yeah, because one ship drops in, because at the same time, Giles is asking, like, how can you prove that Reach fell? Like, how? Yeah, he I doesn't pull- believe anything, because they, they tell him everything. Yeah, he's like, he's like, how can I believe any of this? And then, boop, and then Johnson's like, right. or Wick, sorry, it's Wickham. Wickham's down there, he's like, is that proof enough for you right there? <laughs> yeah, and then he's, it's like... Okay, let's get this going. Yeah, because and that that just all happens, and something that that happens is during this fight, um, Halsey calls in Kelly. Yes, yeah, so, so 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 they leave. They they yeah, go, they yeah, go they back. They go back to their monstrosity of a UNSC Covenant ship, mm-hmm. and that their Frankenstein ship. Their Frankenstein ship, and at this point too, because they're going back for repairs, they have one working plasma turret that kind of works. Yeah, so they're they're kind of in trouble. Yeah, so so they they they're in an asteroid belt, so they're mm-hmm. like they go and hide behind an asteroid, and they're like we got to figure this stuff out. And so at the same time, yeah, this is uh, when Halsey calls in Kelly and basically sedates her, just puts her under really really quick, and and all like Kelly tried to fight it, but it happens, and now we're kind of like get, we get really not a lot of context about this. We're like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, because Kelly's like, I, I thought I was done with my program. And mm-hmm. she's like, no, no, no. I got to get a t- couple other things. Like, just relax there. You'll be fine. Just got to stick these needles in you. Got to stick these needles in you. Just, yeah. Just, just calm down. After she sedates her, she calls Locklear and she's like, uh-huh. hey, come on over here. I need your help. He's like, okay, be quick. Like, can this wait? I got stuff to do. And she's like, uh, no, I need you to move her here because that's what the cap and said to do. Yeah, she said this is the most important thing. And it's yeah. like literally like he walks in, she's just passed out drooling and 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 Halsey's just sitting there just looking casual. She's like captain said you got to do this and of course the guy's just like all right because you know it's it's like always been explained that like Halsey is is she's she's not officially military but everyone listens no one questions what she does yeah. really. And so then yeah, she he he moves her to a pelican, correct? Yes, and it is one of the asteroids pelicans. Uh huh. Yeah. Realize that, and then she hands over the crystal because she yeah. she had just been handling it. He's like, "Are you supposed to have that?" She's like, "We're not in slip space. Doesn't have any radiation right now." I, it's yeah, because cool. I love when he says that. She's just like, "Yeah, that's fine." It slips in her pocket, and then she gives it back to him, and he's like, "Why do I have this?" And she's like. No one can get their hands on this. Oni can't get this. The Covenant can't. Like, she explains, this needs to be destroyed. Yeah, because she brings up, like, you mm-hmm. know what You know what this this crystal caused? The death of this person, this person, and Pulaski. Uh-huh. And we didn't really touch on this, but, like, there was, like, a chemistry, not chemistry thing going between Very hinted. Locklear and Pulaski. Because uh-huh. Locklear gives, like, Pulaski, like, his, like, bandana handkerchief, and it's, like, a whole thing. Yeah, and well, we also notice that, like, he's uh he's wearing it on his arm. Yes. Like, her, her handkerchief, and mm-hmm. he, like, knows he's always, like, kind of referencing it. 
And so, so she she digs at that. She knows because she knows manipulation well. So she's like, she, yeah. She pushes that name hard, and she's like, I mean, you'll know what to do with this crystal when you need to. Yeah. She and you see, kind of Halsey can really, and I think overall she's kind of a sociopath. She switches from being like, this war has really broken me down to just being this sociopath and manipulating someone. And what happens is basically, and this is again, like we talked about these really heart tearing moments and like the flood and we see it here. And they, I, this is a, and I'm always, every time we do a book, I'm probably going to talk about some of my favorite scenes, if not mm-hmm. my favorite scene. And this one is where we, we learn that Locklear was in love with Pulaski. Yeah. It's not, he, he's, he's, he's been grieving this this whole time and he's just feeling this emotion. And because of this crystal, he just puts, you know, he he destroys it. Yeah. So so before that, one of my favorite like lighthearted scenes that happens. So Pulaski has not sorry, not Pulaski. Locklear knows really nothing of this Covenant ship stuff that's going on. Uh-huh. He's got this little robot cart with him, and he's like in the med bay, and he discovers this alcohol stash, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Fuck yes!" <laughs> he's like, and he's like, "We're having happy hour," and he's like, so pumped. He's like, finding the key to unlock this thing, and the ship starts to move, and he's like. We're moving, and he pulls up the outside cams. And he realizes, and that's when he realizes it's the Covenant. And mm-hmm. he's like, "All right, you know, I I don't know why she gave this crystal, but I'm I'm done with this." Yeah. And so finds like a foam explosive. Yeah, and that's when he destroys it, and in the process he dies. But it's just kind of like that was like the straw that break the camel's back. You know, it was mm-hmm. like he just he had had enough, and so. And I don't think he had attended on yeah because it was an accident that he killed himself, but he was just like. I'm destroying this thing, and in the process, he dies. Yeah, because I don't, I don't think from what we've inferred from the power of the crystal, that he doesn't die from the explosive because it's just a foam explosive, and he, and like he like sets it for three seconds and runs. And being an ODST member and being like surviving Halo and surviving, you know, the Pillar of Autumn and all this stuff, mm-hmm. he knows his stuff. I just don't think he realized the repercussions of destroying the crystal. Yeah, and how like this is such a like an important artifact, and what would happen, and what kind of explosion they stumble across this, and they realize there's like only some shards left, mm-hmm. and so they like get those shards because it was like a fist sized crystal in a plastic bag. No, like just to let you know, it's they put it in a plastic bag. <laughs> I, I remember that detail. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> Well, you got to, probably all they had You went through. to Walmart, you grabbed a plastic bag, you went, ah, that's good enough. Yeah, and so this is where they kind of, they kind of then do a round table, and they're like, all right, listen. Um, well, well, even before that, as I like, that they're all kind of wondering, like, why did he do this? And mm-hmm. I think someone finally mentions, like, he knew what he was doing. Yeah, Chief, Chief kind of does this re- retelling. He's like, this is badass. Sur- like, survived Pillar of Autumn, survived the Flood, uh-huh. survived Halo, made him his way out. He was a trained soldier, so obviously he did this for a reason, not just mm-hmm. because he went space mad. Or, yeah, he snapped or anything like that. Yeah. It was he, calculated. It was calculated. And mm-hmm. then that's when they kind of infer, like, where the where the hell's Halsey? Yeah, and then they're like, uh-oh. But it's like one of those things, like, it's an issue, but they can't really worry about it right now because mm-hmm. they have to worry about this Covenant fleet. And it's like, they talk about it's like 500 ships. And yeah. they're kind of trying to figure this out, and they're like, we, we, we need to fight it because... You know, with the Spartans, they do, they they need to fight on the ground. That's always their thing, and they're trying to figure out. And I like that's when Johnson's kind of like, "Well, there's your ground," and he calls it an uneven elephant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but it's the the, yeah. the it's this giant base called the unyielding hierophant. Yeah, <laughs> and he just keeps going the elephant. Yeah, yeah. Elephant. He, he, and they're like, "No, it's the unyielding hi- hierophant," it's and an he elephant. just keeps calling it an uneven elephant, like. He because at the end of the day it doesn't he doesn't care <laughs> which is care. Uh, it is. which if it's if anyone's curious it's the cover art for the this uh, episode yeah. and it's a really cool looking structure and to slightly go back um, the reason we also talked about the structure of this crystal uh, Locklear knew we were jumping to hyperspace or slip space sorry and he's like I'm not dealing with this plasma bouncing around garbage again and all this yeah. random stuff. We're getting to where we need to go, so that's why he destroyed it. So they did a space jump, the slip space jump, to where all these Covenant ships that Cortana had found out yeah. were gathering to make this assault mm-hmm. on Earth. Yeah, and so at that point, Johnson suggests, like, hey, listen, here's a place to fight the elephants. Let's fight there. <laughs> <laughs> and so Chief decides he's going to come up with a plan, like, all right, we're going to destroy the station and that'll mess this fleet up. Like this will really kind of subdue and throw off this invasion to Earth because if this was the invasion that we would have saw at Earth, it, we would not have had a Halo 2. No. They could have written off, they should have just written off Halo 2 with this book. Everyone's like, why didn't we get a sequel? 
did you not read First Strike, you nerds? Yeah, because well. <laughs> cause even Chief says, like, I remember because, so, so, so going back just another bit, I know we're going back a little bit, me and Jess are just so pumped about this thing. The, the, this, this final sequence, the f- Operation First Strike is cool. It's amazing. So, so what happens is they're in slip space, uh-huh. and they're realizing, okay, we need to make our way to Earth, but we need to go interrupt this meeting, basically. So Chief's like, let's take a Covenant drop ship out into slip space. And everyone's like, you can't take a tiny ship out. Like, like that that's not possible. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. And he's like, we have to. So they reinforce it with a bunch of titanium and steel and, yeah. and other stuff. So they'll like, get crushed within the weight of slip space. Yeah, and they, they, throw, they throw a bunch of Spartans into it, and they uh-huh. psh, drop out. And they even describe it because they're like, this was the most, like, like my my bones, even though like all the hydrofoam is set to like be at maximum, uh-huh. they're still feeling their bones rock and yeah, and so they're passing out. But then Chief wakes up and he's like looking out to see it, and, uh-huh. and he's like, "How many ships?" And she's like, she, "I think she was like two ninety, but she's like out of your field of view, five hundred total." Yeah, which that's crazy. And like you, and I like it is described, and you really see this like this atmosphere of like this oh shit situation and. I, I will say, if you would want to make the second half of this book half of the movie, like Operation First Strike is such a cool scene that we're getting mm-hmm. ready to go through, and it, it just cinematically would be beautiful just to see, and like if they could expand on it. Oh, I mean, I mean, we're going to talk about this at the end when we give kind of our own opinions on lore and what this uh-huh. book means. Operation First Strike is one of the coolest moments in the Halo universe. Yeah. Hands down, like, regardless of what, like, we're not even talking about, like, so far, I'm talking about of the expanded universe and what uh-huh. we've seen the games. It's one of my favorite scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really cool. So, so, so they make their way into the uneven elephant pretty yep. easily. Yep. And, uh, so, and, and yes, that was a joke. I, I want people yeah. to know that. Uh, and so they, and if I'm correct, don't they say they, they're making their way through and it's like hours yeah, because what what happens is they 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 come out of slip space mm-hmm. and only Chief's awake and Cortana hails and they're like this is a long shot, but if we say that we are injured and like we need repairs to our ship, yeah, maybe they'll take us over to Elephants. Yeah, and so it's what they do. So yeah, so so this like magnetic ship comes along, drags them in, and they make it in, and yeah. so so they end up Chief's like hey. Uh, we're never coming back to this ship, so just grab literally everything. Yeah, it kind of goes through like this scene of like you know the the armor up, which is something I, I we didn't mention. Cortana, this is a copy of Cortana. Yes, real yes. Cortana's back on Ascendant Justice, Gettysburg. This is a this is just a very kind of boring like this is a Cortana without a personality. It's just it's, like it's combat Cortana. It's best yeah, way to describe yeah, it. and so yeah, just just to clarify that because this becomes kind of an issue later on. Yeah, so, so some CC action, some combat Cortana action. So, she, so she's in there, and Chief was like. Another thing, going back to the dropship, he's like, I mean, if this was real Cortana, she would have comforted me and like had yeah. some words to kind of like make me not edgy. Yeah. And so when they're equipping up, this is the first time we see the SMG. Mm-hmm. So Chief, yeah, just, I remember, I remember hearing Chief that, yeah. is slapping some SMGs on his thighs. He's throwing like twelve grenades on. He's, he's Sergeant Johnsoning this mission. Yeah, pretty much. And he takes a BR. So that's also where we're seeing Chief first handle a BR because mm-hmm. he was always a, a garbage AR guy. <laughs> So he loved that thing forever. <laughs> but this is where he's like, oh, let me go with that noob tube combo. <laughs> and uh, so grabs that. And, uh, you know, take every sidearm. He's like, guys, take literally everything you can because we can always lighten the load. We can never add stuff. Yeah. And so then they they get into the elephant. And like you said, they, they it's like 11 hours, it's 11 hours. They just start going down these corridors and murdering and trying to get to a point where they think like a main hub is. Yeah, and they find this welded shut area mm-hmm. and in which they uh copy Cortana said like this wasn't in like the 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 repair logs. And this is where we start seeing a new enemy for the first time. Mm-hmm. We all of a sudden start seeing these shadows go around and like they're all kind of like what the hell? And finally you see uh the this this Cortana is like I these things are described as brutes mm-hmm. and uh they're not that bad. Yeah, she's literally like they're not that bad, and he's like, they're called brutes. Yeah, and we see it for the first time. It's bigger and wider than a uh, an elite. than elite, and so it instantly it's like everyone's putting rounds into this thing, and nothing's happening, and mm-hmm. it gets his hands around Chief. 
drains the shield completely and starts choking him out. Yeah, just by, just with its bare hands. And then all of a sudden we notice we're with other Spartans at this point. Will and uh, we're with Will, Grace, uh, Linda, and Fred. Mm-hmm. And so Fred and Will are, are all of a sudden like Chief can see in the like kind of his peripherals that like they're fighting something else. So Chief is in this point like. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. I'm being like, because it's noticing he's starting to black out from being strangled by this thing. And it doesn't he, he takes a grenade out and like shoves it in his waistband. Yeah. So he does a full on cyberpunk 2077 trailer thing where he's ch- getting choked out and like envisions like, okay, I have to survive this. Yeah. And then does this like, none of describes it really great. I, I love the description of it, but it's basically just like a, like, it's it's in wrestling and stuff where you basically make your body go limp and try and basically tuck your way out and spin around out yeah. of the hold. Yeah. So he tries that. The brute keeps on. He's like, I gotta get out of this. So yeah, he takes a grenade and just basically shoves it in his belt. So just like shoves the, the it brute's straight belt. down his pants. Yeah. Shoved <laughs> shoves it right down the brute's <laughs> pants, and uh, like tr- like basically tries to separate the two of them. Then yeah, and then and then that eventually does kill the brute. But within all of this, we see that uh, Grace had died. Yeah. So 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 Grace had had no vitals. And they're like, we have to take her with her. And then that's when Chief realizes, like, her whole midsection's basically missing. Yeah, she's she's literally dead. And so they... Uh, excuse me. MIA. Yeah, she's... Yeah. And uh, something I like is that... So Linda basically disappears at this point and... Uh, or earlier, and they told her, be a ghost. Yeah. So cause... she's occasionally providing cover fire and no one knows where it's coming from. Oh, I love it so much. Because when they're on when they're finishing that drop ship, Chief yeah. is like, everyone go heavy but Linda. And Linda starts to like be like, no, 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 no I can and he's like, no, I need you to snipe. Bring, yeah. Bring a bring a close combat weapon and snipe. And he goes, and then her cold voice came back from like being like basically a mass murderer. And she's like, okay, cool. Yeah, just like that's why she is such a cool character because she's just bad ass and as i said she can be kind of a regular character and then just become a a, a, a psychopath when she needs to be yeah and that's what, that's what chief loves and is scared by her he's mm-hmm. like that sometimes that's too cold for me but he's like hey she needs to pull off those like sweet yeah. 360 no scopes deal <laughs> but yeah so uh, you know after all this happens they also uh detonate grace's suit because the covenant can't have yeah, this. Yeah, so, so they basically cold protocol the suit, and they put it on a timer that's basically mm-hmm. making sure that covenant can get anything with it. Yeah, and so they find these reactors, and they they give them ten minutes to detonate. Mm-hmm. And so this is where Chief is like, "Hey, we need we need banshees." So Linda just, of course, these these banshees just drop, and no one can see. And so I like at this point. They have to go find Linda, or he sends off uh, Will and Fred. He says, but I'm going back for Linda. Yeah. She's not dying again. Yeah, so, so they, they put down uh, a vehicle mine on a like a, basically a window yeah. to basically vent out all the atmosphere to clear all these people out while they are they set that bomb up Yeah, to, to get the, the place to explode. And so they set this up, and Chief is trying to, f- like... They're flying around, and yeah, like you said before, Linda pulled off three perfect shots that disabled completely those banshees. He's like, I, I don't even believe that she did it. Yeah, like, like I've never seen a shot like that yeah. before. And then I like when he finds her; she's hanging upside down on like a wire. So she did these these impossible shots. They were saying it's impossible upside down with one hand Mm -hmm. so it's just like she didn't have uh someone with her to help her target and so this is where you really see what kind of asset she is within the unsc and just this overall like it just this incredible character really really finally come to light and you're like holy shit yeah and then and so so she's in the wire she she basically un- Overwatch widows herself <laughs> from the wire and jumps, and then she flies the banshee up, grabs her by the hand, slings uh-huh. her on top. Yeah, so she's it's 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 a cool scene. She's like on top and riding, and then within all this, you know, we had talked about it was like a separate Cortana. We find out to battle this Covenant AI, court this this copy Cortana kept having to make copies of herself. Yeah, and so. It's starting to really like drain this. Like Cortana's glitching out really, really bad. Like what Real we see bad. in Halo Four. Yeah. So, so, so that's kind of what I brought up before when I was talking about how Cortana is basically just going insane, as I talked uh-huh. about previous stuff. And this is where we first start to see the idea of it. Mm-hmm. So she keeps splitting herself, and Chief's like, "Okay, Cortana, open those blast doors." And then there's just like 
8,000 different chatters going on. And eventually yeah. one breaks through and it's like, hey, chief, I separated this Cortana so that I can just talk to you. And this is the second time it happened. Yeah, it's the second time. And she's like glitching out and he's like, I need those blast doors open now. Uh-huh. And then there's all these subroutines that freak out. And then eventually it does happen. But at the same time, that vehicle mine goes off on the mm-hmm. window and it doesn't blow up yet. Like the, yeah. it blows up, but it doesn't shatter the glass. Yeah, and so, so they're all kind of in trouble. Yeah, so so uh, Fred and Chief start firing their banshees at it. Still doesn't happen, and that's their only escape route they have. Uh huh. Oh, well, don't they? Uh, then they make their way out with a uh, spirit. They they get a spirit dropship and make their way out. Yeah, because so so they 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 blow the glass eventually. Because like so, Chief is flying towards it uh, with Linda. He's like, it has to crack, or we're gonna we're gonna crash into it. Uh huh. And so it cracks, but. All his atmosphere starts to vent, and he flies out into space, and he's free yeah. flying. And this is where you're like, goodbye. <laughs> but you realize early, like he's tethered on, and Linda like slaps him and gives him the return thing, brings it back in, uh-huh. again, spirit, and they piece out of there. Yeah, and then this is where you know we kind of see a really cool thing is that uh, they get a transmission, they get an ollie ollie oxen free transmission, and you're kind of like. What I thought they were alone. Who is this? Yeah, who's on who's on band three? Like all the yeah. other bands are Cortana. Because freaking remember out. they they left through just this uh, slip space. Yeah, slip space. And so then all of a sudden we see Wit come again, and we. Re- oh yes, it's so good, dude. This whole scene was amazing. So so it, so, oh, okay, so, okay. so so we have a countdown timer for this bomb mm-hmm. that is inside the elephant. Yeah, and Chief's like we got like four minutes, whatever. And so this is where Wickham's like, hey, guys, that moon you're heading towards, we're behind that moon. Yeah. And everyone's like, what? Yeah. Come on over. It's all good. We'll give it a reunion. And so Chief and the rest of the surviving Spartans take the elevator up. And it's just Johnson. Uh-huh. On, it's just Johnson and Cortana on the bay. Yeah. And he's like, uh, where's Whitcomb and Heverson? And they're like, because it was only just the, the uh, ONSC left. Yeah. Uh, ship left. Yeah. And, or, excuse me. UNSC. And... They're like, where are they? They're like, oh, they're they're on that covenant ship. Yeah, they they're just they're they're going, like yeah. they're they're going towards and, and, that cause, fleet. Because they were like, what are they doing? They're like, did you guys fix the the plasma cannons that were on there? They're like, no, they got no weapons. Yeah, it was just a suicide mission. Yeah. Like you find out they're like, we're like, listen, like this is what needs to happen. Like we're going and buying you guys some time. Yeah, because um, earlier on. Whitcomb and Chief had this conversation about like uh, uh, unequal odds, and they were talking about. So Whitcomb is, is a Texan, uh, he's from yeah. Earth, and he brings up the Battle of the Alamo, and he's like, you know, those hard asses down at the Alamo, you know, it was, it was like hundred to one odds and uh-huh. all that stuff, and then he doesn't finish the story. Uh, and what I love is that Chief, like, so uh, Johnson's like, oh, I can't reach, I'm sorry, and then he's like, all right, Spartans, get on that, and like has the Spartans mm-hmm. get over to the the comm channels, and gets on, and Whitcomb's like. Chief, remember that story about the Alamo I told you? Mm-hmm. And they all died. So it was a defeat, but it was a strategic victory because it shook the enemy to their core and showed them that they were against a fierce enemy. And he's mm-hmm. like, we're about to have basically part number two of that. Yeah, and so, well, you find out they, they separated the Ascendant Justice Gettysburg, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so... Mm-hmm. They put the slip space engine of the Ascendant Justice onto the Gettysburg. Yep. And so they took the Ascendant Justice and going to the uh, unyielding Hierophant, it it crashed into there and then it it destroyed that along with like a vast majority of that fleet. Yeah. So, so what they did was is that they opened up the comm channel and showed that they had the quote unquote crystal intact crystal. Yeah. And they're like, if you guys want to fire upon us, you're gonna lose a crystal. But if you bitches want to do us some hand to hand combat, come and get it. Yeah, basically lured them in and to find out it was it was a fake crystal. Yeah. And so it was just a really cool scene to see that like it it by no means did the Spartans expect this and all of a sudden this is what we get. We get the uh we we get them going out again and we get these these amazing characters sacrificing themselves for this cause within the universe. And it was yeah. just like because as I said, when we first met Whitcomb, he was like, you know, he announces this his bitchy kind of yeah, announces and, his rank on there yeah. and like makes himself a target. And Fred's like, ah, 
great. And then you learn at the end, he's just like this great character that like he's key number two. Yeah, basically. And we, we're now losing someone within the lore that we, we could have needed, but in such a amazing way. And now we're left with only John, Fred, Linda, William, and Johnson. And and what I really enjoy is that um, so 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 they they make their their um, slip space jump and they yeah, do it by the per, cold, cold protocol mm-hmm. because they're like listen there is speculation they're ninety nine percent sure they may have found Earth but yeah. that one percent possibility they didn't so let's still do the cold protocol let's get yeah out we of have here. to and so so John starts going down the the list of people who've passed away and going back he's like. I have to list these as MIA because the Spartans, yeah, the Spartans because it was a morale boost. It's like Spartans don't die; they're just yeah. missing in action. Yeah, uh, Oni made it clear once the Spartan Two project was mm-hmm. uh, public that, like, oh, these Spartans can't be killed. They, it, some do go missing though, but they're Ex- never confirmed to be KIA when they are. Exactly. So, so this is where we learn that you know Spartans never die. Yeah, and and to see Chief, he is, he he keeps asking himself like, why do I have an emotional response? to losing these people. Mm-hmm. He's like, I've seen Marines die. I've seen pilots die, like Plasky and all these others. Yeah. And to like know that these heroes gave their life for this. He's yeah. like, he, and, and it goes back to kind of Halsey bringing up the like, the loss of one is just as important as the loss of many. Yeah. As, you know, as opposed to the old adage of like, mm-hmm. lose a few, save many. Yeah. And so we also see that chief destroys that data crystal with that Johnson's, Johnson's information because he knows like no he's he is an asset like we this is a point where we learn like this man can really help us s- turn the tide of the war like mm-hmm. one person like the same with the Spartan so he mm-hmm. destroys it he says this man is gonna live so at this point they make their way back to Earth because they're gonna warn them about the impending invasion so now we move on to the epilogue of the book mm. so we've wrapped up our chief story. We're on high charity. Now this, I love this. This is all completely, this is all Halo 2 fluff right mm-hmm, here. I loved mm-hmm. this. We see, we meet the Prophet of Truth for the first time, and Tartarus walks up to him, and he said, like, listen, we sweeped like the, the, the destruction of the elephants, and all we found are these few little crystals. We go back, to, no, we go back to where the, where the crystal was in hyperspace. Yeah, 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 and so, yeah, so they, they find those, and Tartarus gives it to, yeah, that was my mistake, so he gives the crystals to the High Prophet of Truth. It's like, it's like three sh- three tiny little sliver sharks. He's yeah. Like, he's like, we had eight crews searching, like, mm-hmm. like quadrants. Yeah, and so the Prophet of Truth is like, okay, cool, uh, reward all these guys for finding this, but then kill them. Mm-hmm. Like, kill them quietly, and you automatically see, uh, A, you see, like, this deception within like the like the politics of the covenant and you see that uh tartarus is like excited he's like cool like he it says like he smiles about it yeah because the prophet of truth um the all the all the elite guards he has yeah they're very surprised that a brute is allowed this close to a or, prophet well, well they say anyone is they're like they he let yeah. someone this to, to get to the point to where he can literally like hand him something or yeah. he like kind of waves it at him and and to and to have him go all you guards leave. It was like 500 elite guards. And he's like, you know, I can use this shock in my, my own purpose type thing. Yeah. And then afterwards, they also say, bring over, like, also bring me the person responsible for the loss of Halo. And then and you're just like, oh, what's going on? And you're like, yes, yes. Especially if, like, you know afterwards whenever you... Like, I had never read this prior, so mm-hmm. then you're like, oh, they're talking about, they're talking about the Arbiter. Yeah. So that, that was it. That's first strike. That's first strike for you guys. And that's just amazing storytelling from Nyland. I, I really liked this book. Uh, so this is the point to where we go on and we say, what does this do for the lore of Yeah, what, is it, what does this do, you know, for, for a lot of this right now is our own opinion on this lore aspect that we bring uh-huh. up. But as with every book, especially the books coming out... Now, to where we're past kind of CE and we're getting into more of like a really interesting lore building aspect, we're kind of uh-huh. 
bring you guys what we think it kind of pertains to and what it really does bring to the Halo universe. Yeah, and so I think I think the the main thing that we in in the grand scheme of things briefly see are the brutes. Mm -hmm. We see the brutes for the first time. We're introduced to so many weapons and very important things as well. Is that there are still surviving uh, Spartans out there? That 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 is number one for the book because if you don't read the books, uh huh. You go through CE 2 and 3, and you're like, it's Master Chief. Yeah, and that's then you, it. Then you get to 4, and then they start talking about Spartans are with you, and you're like, is that just another name for, like, these fucking Marines that are following me around? Yeah. And then, because, like, you do, like, um, there's different ops you can do in 4, where, like, you have mm -hmm. Spartans drop in. Yeah. And then at 5, obviously, you have the different teams. Yeah. And well, we're starting to learn more about like less like like surviving Spartan twos by reach for game way gameplay wise. You see that there were Spartan threes, but they're still they they quote unquote all the Spartans die on reach exactly. except for Chief. That's what they kind of like establish because like it's very interesting to see, like for the longest time, even like before I had ever touched a book, I'd always thought Chief was the last one. I remember listening to to songs like metal songs written about talking about like the quote last of a dying breed, and then you realize like. Nah, not at all. So. No, like, like, like in your in your chronological games, sure. Yeah, like, and like you said, Reach is the one where you do play as other Spartans, mm -hmm. but obviously it's Reach. Yeah, and they all die, and so it's always like it, it's not implied, but you know, within the games, it's never deterred that he is the only Spartan. So we learn in this this novel, but in two, by two thousand three that he is not the only Spartan. Mm -hmm. So and, it was very cool to see that. Yeah, and that's, and that's really why I find these books invaluable. If you are a Halo fan and you've played the games, which are excellent, uh -huh. but if you get to five and you're like, why does he have these Spartans with him? That yeah. apparently, that apparently th like they go on in detail that like, oh, they've known each other since they were kids. And it's like, but... But I thought it was the only one. Yeah, they didn't bring anything up about it. Yeah, so definitely, um, it's and and three four three didn't make the mistake of having to know all these books versus yes. Bungie saying you don't have to, but it it makes you appreciate little things more. Mm -hmm. So definitely, you know that important thing. You know, we, we started seeing new weapons. We see the brutes for the first time. We see the engineers some more, and we see high charity along with the prophet of truth and we automatically start seeing these shady ways that they're dealing with elites these incompetent elites and everything yeah cuz i think i think in the paperback book itself i think the epilogue is only 4 or 5 pages it's not long and within those 4 or 5 pages like that already shows you the seat and like how the brutes are somehow weirdly rising to this power mm -hmm. because i think it's either cortana or i think it's the the duplicate cortana brings up when chief is on there that the brutes are described as like this kind of like holy religious like defenders yeah so i think it's already kind of brought up about the this, prophets want to do this the second that uh fell lost with fell the arbiter mm -hmm. uh let the let halo be destroyed that's definitely when they're like okay we can no longer they 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 said we can no longer re rely on the elites which was their demise it, you know we know within lore because mm -hmm. if if the great schism had not happened then humanity would have fallen yeah i i know that for a fact but it was really cool like it said within a handful of pages it's a just all fluff to build it up for Halo 2, sure. which I think was great. And I said this was this was the last book within that, that first line uh, or that first trilogy uh, in between Halo CE and Halo 2. And I thought it was it was an amazing book. I thought it was too. And and even building the lore stuff, which I just really enjoyed, is just the idea of we we've always heard in every Halo game, holy relics, holy sites, holy this, this, and that. Uh -huh. And to actually see a book where humanity gets their hands on one and it actually does something. Yeah. It's it, it's whether whether it's truly a forerunner relic, um, which it's implied to be, or that it's just this random thing that's yeah. out there somehow. Like it's it's very cool to see humanity do it and mm. to be like an early adapter of it. The Sorry, the other thing that I really, really, really enjoyed with this mm -hmm. was Nyland's kind of thing with Fred, with knowing that somehow he understood all these Covenant controls. Yeah, and it's never really touched on, or, like, is it really, like, truly explained? I think Nyland takes some liberties to do this. stuff. clearly, like, Bungie had approved it. They're like, yeah, I like that idea, because, you know, these authors have good ideas mm -hmm. that maybe some of the writers over at Bungie don't. Yeah. And so... 
it definitely like an interesting like, little tidbit that was playing off of Master Chief knowing those forerunner things. So I like that definitely uh, Nyland was uh, playing off of everything that Dites did for uh, the Flood. Yeah, it's, it's to give those little inklings that this like humanity mm-hmm. knows for some reason this forerunner tech, this tech. They're yeah. like somehow it's in our old DNA that like somehow mm-hmm. I understand this stuff. And even if that wasn't exactly the hundred percent case that Bungie was going for at the time, we know later on in the lore, once three four three gets their mm-hmm. hands on the name, that's kind of what happens. Spoiler alert, which we will we will be talking about eventually, of course. But overall, let's go on to what did you think about this book? I know clearly we always drop our opinions in mm-hmm. there, but throughout the the telling, but what did you think of it? I thought out of the three is my favorite. I I, I thought. If you were to if you were to go through and read this book by itself and not read the other two, it wouldn't make much sense and it would be eh. Yeah. But once you've kind of gone through the loss of like he's the only Spartan, mm-hmm. you know, he did Halo and this stuff, like it it was just it would I thought for Nyland it was a better of the two books. Mm-hmm. I thought obviously the first book really set everything up. It was very interesting. Yeah. But the writing style and really what he brought to it within lore and cool sci-fi and war and tech. I thought he did a really, really good yeah. job with it, and I thought it's an excellent book. For me, it was that those emotional scenes mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. Uh, you see the Locklear, or not Locklear. Uh, uh, Locklear to the Crystal, and they have Pulaski with like her ship. And... Or, yeah, it was Locklear who, who basically died because he was so fed up and he mm-hmm. lost someone they loved. Along with, uh, and we see Wickham and Haverson go and give their lives, you know, with like, hey, you know, the Alamo, like that, that was for a reason. So definitely playing with your emotions like that and making you actually, you know, there are books you read and throughout the Halo series, there are characters that die that you don't wince at, but to be able to make us upset that we're losing these characters, that's great writing to me. I mean, they even had story arcs. Yeah. Haverson, who was like this, like button up O and I, like Oni person, mm-hmm. who was like chief. I gotta give you command. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the better officer. Like mm-hmm. he goes with and sacrifices himself for this stuff. Yeah. So it was. This was a great book. Yeah, I, and I want to agree with you 100. percent I liked this better than Reach. I know we will get Nyland one more time, mm-hmm. and it's also mm-hmm. also a phenomenal book. He he has contributed a lot of cool things to the Halo universe, and for me, I want to give it. I'm I'm gonna go with about five out of five. If if we have to rank it like that, um, five out of five. I would say so. It, it's up there. Like like I mean, for me, there wasn't much writing mistakes I even noticed mm-hmm. with it. I mean, obviously. It gives you this really cool. It's it's a book that doesn't have to happen, but it happens and it happens so well. Like and he puts a lot of things that didn't have to be said. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool. It was a great one so far. You know, if we're having to rank the books that we go by, I think this is the top right now. I'd and say I think, 100%. It, and it had you know, of course, it had some mixed reviews. Some people thought it was really cool. Some people were like, eh, it was kind of like it was kind of like the fall of Reach. And some people said, eh, it was just a little too repetitive and detailed. It was very detailed. Uh, by all means, it's really hard to keep up with them sometimes. Like that fight between Chief and the Brute. Yeah. Once he starts doing all those maneuvers, I was a little confused. But by all means, I'm not gonna say that. That as a whole, that ruins the book for me. I agree because I'd rather you give me over details for me to have to interpret somehow. Mm-hmm. Then you leave stuff out, and you're just like, like, don't Game of Thrones season eight me. Yeah, I I have never seen Game of Thrones, so I'll agree. Don't you know, just don't Game of Thrones season eight. <laughs> like 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 don't don't give me things that could have resolutions that you just don't even touch upon, and you just shit on mm-hmm. characters. Like, yeah. So I, I like I said overall. It's my favorite book thus far, as we've mm-hmm. read for you guys, and so I'm excited for the next one. Exactly. So overall, that was First Strike. Before, before hopefully you're still with us, before you decide to end this episode, we have some cool things coming up. Of course, the next episode that's coming up is Halo 2, and I know we've been talking this up, and I, we have been working on research for this episode for what... <sighs> month and a half, two months, three months? About two months now. Yeah. Almost since right after we started... CE. Or we, we we did CE. Mm-hmm. I started working on notes for uh, Halo Two, and we've we've just been going through it. We're gonna have a game night coming up here very very soon. Along with, we're gonna have a giveaway that yep. we're gonna be doing yeah, on yeah, our yeah. social media. Uh, that's gonna go along with it. We're not gonna announce it just yet, but please keep an eye out on our Instagram. Check out that Insta baby. It will be there, and we have a Discord now. We have a Discord, so that'll be if you're listening 
on YouTube or whether you're through SoundCloud or checking out the rest of our social. We have a Discord channel. We'd love for you guys mm-hmm. to join. We talk about, you know, kind of all things Halo, but just in general, reaching out to you guys and seeing what you guys think and uh-huh. just to get to know you guys. It already has a lot of cool conversations going on. Yeah, we got like 25 members. Yeah, that's we're, really, we're up there. Well, it's really cool. And I th- it's been fun for me so far I and like you. Mm-hmm. So, again, thank you for tuning in. This, this was a really fun one. This is actually a longer one for a book. Yeah. So, and it was really fun to do because it was a great book to go through everything that we learned about the universe. And with that, I am your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And thank you in for tuning in to Finish the Fight, a Halo podcast. Halo, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started.